Good morning. Happy New Year, everybody. It's 2024. Three days in. I hope your new year was good. I stayed up for the first time in several years and actually welcomed in the new year. It's probably a good thing I did too because at midnight, the bungalows, the resort right across the, the street here from us set off a bunch of fireworks. So we kind of knew that. We went outside and enjoyed that beginning to our new year. Of course, I always enjoy a good cup of coffee and look what I found. Actually, it's kind of just covered and hidden on my desk, but I have that coffee uh, warmer. You put it on there. It keeps the coffee warm. I love one of my pet peeves. I don't like cold coffee usually or lukewarm coffee. I want a hot cup of coffee. So when I saw this, I'm like, why haven't I been using that? So I got my cup of coffee this morning, nice and hot to finish up in these few minutes with you. Uh, so just wanted to, to talk about, like we usually do, a few verses in the Bible. Before kind of the Christmas season, we were wandering through the gospel according to Matthew together, just looking at different things. And, and one of the coolest things in the gospel of Matthew is the Sermon on the Mount. It's the most complete uh, sermon we have preserved in the scriptures that Jesus preached. There's, there are other snippets of his teaching and things, but this Matthew is three chapters, chapter five, six, and seven of a single sermon Jesus preached. Like I said, call it the Sermon on the Mount. And we had looked at some of it. We're kind of toward the end. And as I was reading it to get ready for this, I came across what is to me definitely one of the most sobering, and, and maybe surprising is also a good word, well, some of the most surprising and sobering words of Jesus. They're in Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 21. Let me read them for you, and I think as I read them, you will, you will sense why they're, they kind of are so arresting in, in their content. This is what Jesus says. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. As you can see, <clears throat> pretty sobering words, pretty uh, almost harsh words here. Now, now, some things we, we get, uh, for instance, when he starts out saying, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. We know that, not just in, in a religious sense, but in, in any sort of sense. Um, we have sayings that reinforce that. For instance, one saying we have is talk is cheap. Or another saying, actions speak louder than words. So I could look at that first verse and go, yeah, that makes sense. Actions speak louder than words. You can say anything. I could, I could say in the new year, I'm going to lose 50 pounds. I can say in the new year, I'm going to keep my office spotless. And you know the likelihood of either one of those happening? <laughs> Slim to none. But I said it. No, saying it is one thing or making the resolution even out loud is one thing. It's following through. It's doing the things that are necessary, whether it's diet and exercise to lose some weight, whether it's organization and, and, and planning that's required to keep something neat, whatever it is, we understand that. And so on, on one level, we read that verse and it's not surprising to us. But then it's the next part that really, really gets us where, where he says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, but then what are they saying? They're saying all the things they did. They're talking about what they say, but then we see some actions. We see uh, so, some pretty good actions to prophesy, to drive out demons, to perform miracles. We would think, oh, those are, those are all good things. Those are all church things. Those are all religious things. And how does Jesus describe those actions? This is the really remarkable thing to me. He calls the people who, who say this and who have done those things. He says, away from me, you evil doers. What? Now, I wouldn't call those things evil if I was just giving a list of, of things. I, I wouldn't say that those are things that are evil. But, but obviously, these are the words of Jesus. So, so he knows something I don't. He's trying to communicate something that maybe at first blush, I wouldn't realize. And, and what he tells us is the very thing that's missing. So, so on the one hand, he says, you can say whatever you want, but if you don't follow it up with action, your words are meaningless. But then in the second part, and really the, the most troubling or sobering part 
is he says, even sometimes your actions can be meaningless, can be empty, or can be evil if there's something missing. The question is, what's missing? I'm glad that Jesus tells us what's missing. And he says it there in verse 23. Then I will tell them plainly. And here's four words. I never knew you. I never knew you. So apparently... What Jesus is emphasizing is not simply the action, even religious action. There's something more that needs to be behind or underneath our actions. And it can't be just lip service or mere words. And it can't be just duty or ritual or religious action. There's got to be something more. And the something more that he says is, I never knew you. Apparently that's important. In fact, I'm reminded of another verse of scripture. Uh, again, the words of Jesus. This is in John chapter 17. John chapter 17. Um, real quick, John chapter 17 is part of a very long section. You'll see a lot of red letters in chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, or maybe 14, 15, 16, 17, that all happens in the context of what we call the Last Supper. With, right before he's, he's arrested and crucified, Jesus spends that Last Supper with his disciples. And there, John chapter 17 is called uh, sometimes the high priestly prayer of Jesus. It records a prayer Jesus prayed in the midst of his disciples. And in John chapter 17, verse 3, here's what he says. He says, now this is eternal life. Hey, wait a minute, you got my attention. This is eternal life. We would say, if you were having a conversation with just about anybody, uh, we would say eternal life is good. In fact, we might think of, of how much we try to have as long a life as we possibly can. My, my wife's grandfather lived to be 106 years old. That's a pretty long life. That, that's a remarkably long life. You know, you watch the Today Show and... I don't know if it's still happening. It used to be they'd have every day uh, shout outs to birthdays, people that were 100 years old on that day. It's a pretty big accomplishment, 100 years. How much greater is eternal life? Now, this is eternal life. We want to live as long as we can. Eternity, yeah. And then we add to that the reality when we say eternal life, we usually have it connected to our religious background. We think eternal life, particularly in heaven, we think of uh, to use a, a very generic and maybe sometimes meaningless phrase that we talk about with people that, that have passed away. We say they've gone to a better place. In our mind, eternal life is something that is good and, and forever, and, and that's what the Bible would describe as heaven. Um, but Jesus says, now this is eternal life. And how does he define eternal life? This is eternal life, John 17, 3, that they may know you, the only true God, and your son, meaning Jesus, whom you have sent. What's the key? Knowing. This is eternal life that you may know God through Jesus Christ. Now notice, it doesn't say, this is eternal life that you do religious things. This is eternal life that you go to church every Sunday. This is eternal life that you give money every Sunday or, or regularly. Now this is eternal life that you pray regularly, that you read your Bible regularly. Those are all good things, right? Those are all religious things. They are things that, that Many of us, and myself including, try to do as an expression of our religious faith. But notice, when we get to the issue of eternal life, what makes an eternal difference, it's not our religious activity. Back to, to Matthew chapter 7, it's not simply saying the right words or saying a certain prayer. Uh, it's, so if it's not a religious activity, it's not saying the right words, what is it? Well, there it is. Jesus says in Matthew 7, I never knew you. Jesus says in John 17, this is eternal life that you may know me. So apparently there's something about knowing God. We would sometimes use the phrase, have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That's what we mean by knowing God, right? That, that we have a relationship with him. That the idea that Jesus came for our salvation to die on the cross for our sins, to make it possible for us to be forgiven and have eternal life it's really not just about here's a perk, here's the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, the reward that you get. No, it's about some new thing in our life, new characteristic of our life that involves us having a relationship with God, with Jesus Christ, knowing them. 
Now, now there's a difference, let me say this as well, between knowing somebody and knowing about somebody. And this is an important difference that, that religiously we need to talk about. Because I think a lot of people know about Jesus Christ. We just came off Christmas and you can ask a lot of people, particularly in our culture, um, what is the religious significance of Christmas? And they'll say, well, Jesus was born. They might even say in Bethlehem. And they would kind of know about Jesus. Uh, same way you could ask me about George Washington or about Abraham Lincoln or about, I don't know, any number of other people in history. And I would know some facts about them, but I do not know George Washington personally. I do not know Abraham Lincoln personally. We could even bring a modern person, um, somebody that that is that is uh, uh, maybe your favorite sports star. You know, I'm a, a big football fan and, and watch football. Maybe your, your favorite quarterback or, or your favorite player on your favorite team. I can know a lot about, I can list off all the stats, but do I know them? Does simply reciting stats mean I know? No, I don't have a relationship with them. Same thing is what's at issue here. God has invited us into a relationship with him through Jesus Christ. And the, the defining characteristic of that relationship isn't knowledge. It's not words that we recite, lip service. It's not even religious ritual. The defining characterization of that relationship is that we know him. We know him, not about him. We know him personally. That's why he's revealed himself through the Bible. That's why he invites us to pray, to, to have conversations with him, much like you have conversations with, with your spouse or with your best friend that, that cements the relationship. We have that same opportunity. And I think that's the beauty of Christianity is that God invites us not simply to a list of rituals, not simply to some uh, incantation that brings blessing, but to an intimate, ongoing, growing relationship with him that we can know him. I hope in this new year, you know Jesus Christ. My resolution every year, maybe it's stated, maybe it's not, maybe it has steps to it, is that I will come to know God better through Jesus Christ, that my life will show an increasing uh, awareness and intimacy with the God who loved me, who sent his son to die on the cross for me, and who is my savior and my hope for eternity. I hope that somewhere in your resolutions, formal, informal, stated or unstated, explicit or ex implicit is the idea that you're going to get to know Christ better. If you've never made a decision to know Christ, we invite you to come learn more about him, to learn who he is, what he has done, and how he has provided for your salvation. That's what we talk about every time we get together, Sunday mornings or any of the other times. We're focusing on the goodness of God as he's revealed himself to us through Jesus so that we might have a relationship with him. Not just here, on this earth and however many years we have, but forever and ever, we might have eternal life knowing our eternal God. If you don't know him, we invite you to be a part of us. Sunday's 9 a.m. is our worship service. That's kind of the front door where we kind of get in. We stream it over the internet. You can maybe check us out that way, but we'd love to have you join us in person. Either way, my prayer for you in the year 2024, if you don't know God through Jesus Christ, that you'll come to know him. And if I can do anything to help you, drop me a line, drop an email, call the church office. I'd love to do that. Or if you already know him, that you'll get to know him better, that your relationship with him will grow and become deeper and that you'll realize that that's the key. This is eternal life, not religious ritual, not lip service, not even some sort of obedience to, to certain things. It's to know God, to know him personally, to know him well, and to grow in that knowledge of him. That's my encouragement for you this January 3rd and throughout this new year. I uh, hope you're having a great first week of the year, and I do hope to see you soon, maybe in one of our worship services. So if not, until maybe Sunday morning at nine or until next Wednesday when we meet online. Have a great week. Talk to you soon.